grande è la misericordia del Signore, dice il Salmo. In questi giorni ho potuto leggere un libro di un cardinale, il cardinale Casper, un teologo in gamba, eh? un buon teologo, sulla misericordia. E mi ha fatto tanto bene quel libro, ma non credete che faccio pubblicità ai libri dei miei cardinali, eh? Non è così. Ma mi ha fatto tanto bene, tanto bene. Il cardinale Casper diceva che sentire misericordia, questa parola, cambia tutto. È il meglio che noi possiamo sentire. Cambia il mondo. Un po' di misericordia rende il mondo meno freddo e più giusto. Since the election of Pope Francis, mercy has become one of the most discussed and debated topics in the Church. It's always been understood as a defining attribute of God in the Judeo-Christian tradition. But today mercy is taking on a more practical meaning in the ministry of Pope Francis. He preaches mercy so often, not only in words but in actions, that it can be alarming and even seems like something totally new. But is it really? For a church with a long tradition, Catholics sometimes have a short memory. I think John Paul II had a very deep experience of all the suffering in our world in the 20th century. He grew up in Poland during the Nazi time, during the Second World War, during the time of Shoah, and then the communist period, and he knew what sufferings are there, and this was the root from where he spoke about mercy, and he discovered especially his sister Faustina Kowalska, who had this vision about mystical experience about uh, mercy, he made her a saint. Uh, it was the first canonization of the Jubilee year 2000, and therefore it has a symbolic meaning, this canonization of John Paul II. And uh, so uh, Pope Francis is in the lone line with all his predecessors, with Pope John XXIII, uh, Pope uh, Paul VI, Pope John Paul II, and now Benedict, first encyclical about uh, God is love. So it's a, it's a, a very important continuity uh, here in the post-conciliar church. The post-conciliar church refers to the past 50 years since the Second Vatican Council, when a great paradigm shift had occurred. It all started with another pope, the affable and jovial John XXIII. He wanted the council to show the church to be the loving mother of all, benign, patient, full of mercy and goodness. Gaudet Mater Ecclesia. In every age, the Church opposes errors, John said in his opening address to the Council on October 11, 1962. But today, he argued, the Church prefers to make use of the medicine of mercy rather than that of severity. And to the surprise of many, the Council followed suit in the language and tone of its 16 official declarations. That internal shift to an attitude of mercy had an enormous impact on Bishop Carol Waitiwa of Krakow, who was eventually elected Pope in 1978. Just two years later, the new Pope issued an encyclical on God's mercy. The Church today is profoundly conscious 
that only on the basis of the mercy of God will she be able to carry out the tasks that derive from the teaching of the Second Vatican Council. The Church lives an authentic life when she professes and proclaims mercy, the most stupendous attribute of the Creator and of the Redeemer, and when she brings people close to the sources of the Savior's mercy. John Paul's understanding of mercy had been strongly influenced by the life and personal diary of a young Polish nun named Faustina Kowalska. Jesus had appeared to Faustina on numerous occasions in the 1930s, asking her to make known his divine mercy to the world. That message resonated strongly with John Paul, who promoted Faustina and the message of divine mercy throughout his pontificate and canonized her as the first saint of the new millennium. You, Faustina, a gift of God to our time, a gift from the land of Poland to the whole church, obtain for us an awareness of the depth of divine mercy. Help us to have a living experience of it and to bear witness to it among our brothers and sisters. Vivir supone ensuciarse los pies. Life means getting our feet dirty from the dust-filled roads of life and history. All of us need to be cleansed, to be washed, all of us, and me in first place. All of us are being sought out by the teacher who wants to help us resume our journey. The Lord goes in search of us. To all of us, he stretches out a helping hand. Señor, para darnos su mano. Like his predecessor, Pope Francis has put mercy at the center of his ministry. For him, it's not enough to talk about mercy or promote a devotion to the divine mercy. It's about accompanying people through the difficult and complex experiences of everyday life, through their joys and hopes, griefs and anxieties. Realities, as Francis often says, are more important than ideas. Alcune volte io ho parlato della chiesa come ospedale di campo. È vero, quanti feriti ci sono, quanti feriti, quanta gente che ha bisogno che le sue ferite siano guarite. Questa è la missione della chiesa, guarire le ferite del cuore, aprire porte, liberare, dire che Dio è buono, che Dio perdona tutto, che Dio è padre, che Dio è tenero, che Dio ci aspetta sempre. I believe there are much more open and, and honest discussions because of what the Holy Father said last year and this year. He's given people the opportunity and I think his his example, it's, it's very clear that he totally trusts in the work of the Holy Spirit and expects us to do the same. Another distinction that, upon which we have relied very heavily and that no longer communicates is the distinction between public and private. In other words, the truth in public and mercy in private. That the compassion of the confessional tempers the, the clarity of the pulpit that I think what we need now, and this is what I'd like to see emerge from this Synod, are public and public enactments of mercy, not just doing mercy in private behind closed doors or in a confessional. And it's the sort of public enactment of mercy that we see, I think, in Pope Francis, who's, in a sense, modelling what I think the whole church has to ponder. But when you've been used to centuries of thinking about mercy in private, truth in public, it's not always easy to even imagine what the public enactment of mercy might look like. And when you do see it, it can, be, it can be even be unsettling. So the fact that these grand old distinctions no longer communicate, which is what I mean when I say they don't work, can in fact be unsettling. But again, a pastoral approach is relentlessly geared to the facts. Otherwise, we, we indulge in this discourse, which is beautiful in itself, 
self-contained but does not put down roots in the soil of human experience. The Synod of Bishops on the Family gave the Church an opportunity to reflect on what a merciful pastoral approach looks like in the face of concrete family challenges. Determined that this approach sink into the Catholic psyche, Pope Francis opened a worldwide Jubilee Year of Mercy a few weeks later. Questo Jubileo, insomma, è un momento privilegiato perché la Chiesa impari a scegliere unicamente ciò che a Dio piace di più. E che cosa è che a Dio piace di più? Perdonare i Suoi figli, aver misericordia di loro, affinché anch'essi possano a loro volta perdonare i fratelli, risplendendo come fiaccole della misericordia di Dio nel mondo. Questo è quello che a Dio piace di più. In an official message issued for the Jubilee Year of Mercy, Francis boldly restated the Church's mission to proclaim the mercy of God. Mercy is the very foundation of the Church's life. All of her pastoral activity should be caught up in the tenderness she makes present to believers. Nothing in her preaching and in her witness to the world can be lacking in mercy. The Church's very credibility is seen in how she shows merciful and compassionate love. Francis's official message for the Year of Mercy struck a chord. He quoted John Paul's encyclical, implored St. Faustina's intercession, and praised the Second Vatican Council for recognizing 50 years ago that the Church's language and pastoral outreach had to become more merciful if it was to be faithful to Christ and to reach people today. The walls which for too long had made the Church a kind of fortress were torn down and the time had come to proclaim the gospel in a new way. It was a new phase of the same evangelization that had existed from the beginning. I've studied the Second Vatican Council, I've written about it, I mean I kind of got dragged into it at first but then uh, and became a great fan of it. I thought it was really a, just what the church needed, it was kind of get, getting the church back to its a, a whole other level, a deeper level, a, a more authentic level, and uh, I just see Francis as carrying that forward. Much has changed over the past 50 years in the church and in the world. But the six bishops who in that time have occupied the chair of St. Peter have shown a remarkable continuity in preaching mercy, the most important message of Jesus and the very identity of God. It's a good news, it's a gospel message, a good news for everybody and I think the church has to give witness of this good news, not of commandments only, but God is for you, God says yes to you in every situation. The highly anticipated World Youth Day in Krakow, Poland is one of the most concrete expressions of mercy in continuity, a celebration of faith in the city of mercy, the city of St. Faustina and St. John Paul II, the city that welcomes Francis, the Pope of Mercy, the city that brings together young people from around the world, torn apart by hatred and indifference, to say to that world, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I want to be completely transformed into your mercy and to be your living reflection, O Lord. May the greatest of all divine attributes, that of your unfathomable mercy, pass through my heart and soul to my neighbor. Help me, O Lord, 
that my eyes may be merciful, so that I may never suspect or judge from appearances, but look for what is beautiful in my neighbor's souls and come to their rescue. O oh, my Jesus, transform me into yourself, for you can do all things.